What a morning so far, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Equities building on the gains. Equity markets at nine-month highs. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, the S&P 500 closing out the week near nine-month highs as President Biden looks for a debt deal this weekend and one Fed official leaves the door wide open for June. We begin with the big issue. Investors looking to see if Powell walks through it. The Fed chair set to close out quite a week for Fed speak after President Logan of the Dallas Fed left the door wide open for a move next month, saying the data in coming weeks could yet show that it's appropriate to skip a meeting. As of today, we aren't there yet. Governor Jefferson signaled he's leaning towards a pause, and President Bostick left most of us confused, saying, quote, a pause could be a skip or it could be a hold. Bank of America's Mike Gapen doing his best to wrap it all up. Our baseline is they're done. There are a lot of things we need to get past in order to clear the decks for another Fed rate hike. And this is what we need to get past on the calendar. Payrolls on June 2nd, CPI on June 13th, and a debt ceiling X date somewhere in between. Our team coverage begins right now with Bloomberg's Anne Marie in Japan. Mike McKee here in New York. Mike McKee, the chairman, a few hours away. The chairman a few hours away, and that's where you're going to have to look for any news. We had John Williams, the president of the New York Fed, speaking this morning, and Governor Mickey Bowman, both of them uh, making news but not talking about current monetary policy. Williams at a conference in honor of former, uh, the late Fed researcher Thomas Laubach, with whom he produced estimates of R star, the natural rate of interest given the growth rate of the United States. They suspended it during the pandemic because the data wasn't reliable. He's bringing it back now and he says the main longer term consequences from the pandemic period is a reduction in potential outfit. But the imprint on our star appears to be relatively modest. Importantly, there's no evidence that the era of very low natural rates of interest has ended. So he's suggesting the U.S. is going to grow more slowly and interest rates will go back to being low like they were. At least according to him, he has produced some uh, new data now. This is quarterly data and it shows basically no change in roughly where our star is, although they're estimating going forward into 2023 that it will fall to about half a percent, which is sort of where we were right before the pandemic. Mickey Bowman, the uh, governor who supervises banks mostly uh, out today, speaking to the Texas Bankers Association and suggesting that perhaps the Fed should have an outside counsel take a look at what went wrong with SVB and signature banks. One of the most effective steps they could take would be to encourage an independent third party to analyze the events surrounding the failure of the banks so we can fully understand what led to the failures. She does seem to be pushing back against Vice Chairman Michael Barr's efforts to increase regulation, saying the banks that recently failed were unique in their operations and business models. Those failures alone do not justify layering on an inefficient and overly complex supervision on a broad range of other banks. So news for people who follow banks, news for people who follow interest rates, but nothing about what the Fed's going to do on June 14th. Next up, the Fed chair, a couple of hours away. Before we get to June 14th, AMH, we need to get through that X date. And let's hope we don't go through it. And Marie, I understand based on recent reporting that maybe that X date and that early June number that the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen gave us might actually be quite real. Well, that's what the Treasury Secretary said as soon as June 1st. And you're not uh, lying when you say it might be real. And the momentum you're hearing, Jonathan, from the White House, from Congress and the, and the Republicans is that it is moving in a positive direction and potentially that impetus is coming from the fact that they are concerned that June 1st is really a live date or the first week of June is really a live date. They don't have a lot of wiggle room to raise the debt ceiling and hammer out a, a spending cut deal. What you're hearing here at the G7 on the sidelines of uh, these 
ga this gathering the president is taking part alongside global leaders is that he's also having to, you know, schedule some time as well to keep in touch with his team in Washington, D.C. So it started early this morning. He had roughly a 20-minute call with his negotiating team in Washington. He wants to keep that momentum. Speaker McCarthy saying potentially there could be a deal in principle by the weekend. The president would love to see that when he returns home to Washington after he cut his trip short, ending it here in Japan instead of going on to Papua New Guinea and Australia. And then he left a G7 dinner with world leaders early to make sure he can have another phone call with Washington as they begin their day today and is going to be another day of negotiations between the White House and Republican leadership. And Marie, thank you. AMH in Japan, Mike McKee here in New York City. Here's the calendar. June 2nd, payrolls. June 13th, CPI. Somewhere in between, who knows where. The X ceiling, X date, whatever you want to call it. Let's get to John Hancock's Emily Rowland, Jay Piloski at TPW. Emily, let's talk about it. Just how wide open is the door to another hike next month? Yeah, the odds of a rate hike in June have gone from 15% to 39% just over the course of a week. And we've seen market sentiment really driving that higher. It's almost as investors are sort of baiting the Fed, saying that if you're going to pause here, we're just going to keep running. Um, and it's working exactly in the opposite way in which Powell and, and the rest of the Federal Reserve had hoped here. So I think it's certainly open in terms of June. We're going to get a lot of data between now and then, uh, but we'll have to see here. Never mind the cuts, Jay. Is the data questioning a pause next month? Uh, no, I, I don't think so, John. I mean, uh, I believe the Fed is on hold. Uh, I believe they're done. Um, the inflation numbers for the next few months are going to come in very benign. Uh, remember back in May last year, uh, inflation was 0.9. In June last year, it was 1.2. We're probably going to be close to 3.5 to 4% um, uh, at the end of June here in the U.S. So I think more importantly than the pause, John, is that the Fed updates its economic forecast. It's going to raise the GDP estimate, which is going to validate the soft landing, validate uh, the higher earnings estimates and positive corporate forward guidance that we've seen coming out of Q1. And I think that's what the markets are sensing. We're over 4,200, which, as we know, is a very important technical level. I think that's going to draw in money. If we get a debt ceiling deal, which we will, the last thing we want to do is uh, show China and the rest of the world that we're not able to handle our finances. So um, I think we're up and out, John, as you know, I've been saying now for several months. Well, Jay, you mentioned a growth story. The Atlanta Fed GDP now forecasts something close to 3 three percent. Who knows what those upgrades might look like if we do indeed get upgrades from the Fed at the June meeting. Jay, standout headline for me in the notes I received from you and the team. Jay Pulaski shifting money into tech-related growth. Jay, what's happening there? <laughs> yeah, it is a big change for us, John. Uh, and uh, it's basically because um, I believe AI is for real. Um, it, uh, it benefits the big tech companies. Uh, the big tech got derated last year, uh, worries over high interest rates. That was our big thrust. We were deeply underweight tech all through 22 and up to very recently. So we're not early on this call, but in essence, uh, big tech is your best play on AI, which is kicking off a new innovation cycle for technology. It has a wide moat because of how much money is needed to play it. Uh, big tech is no longer exposed to interest rate hikes because the hikes are done. And so they're also a very good hedge against recession. So we have now moved from uh, our prior position, at least in the U.S., we still favor non-U.S. over U.S., but that's another story. Yep. Uh, we have a barbell. Uh, now between uh, big tech growth and uh, cyclicals in the U.S. because we do think we're about to see uh, a little bit of a rotation as the Fed does what we just talked about. We're going to see a rotation uh, back into the cyclicals as new money comes into the market. So your real play right now today is um, buying the cyclicals in anticipation of the Fed moves that we just talked about. Well, let's unpack some of that. I'll save the rest of the world stuff for later in the program. Let's focus <laughs> on the tech call. Emily, looking at these moves, biggest gain this year today on the S&P 500. NVIDIA at 116%, <laughs> Meta at 105%. Are they stories you want to chase? Yeah, John, I mean, AI is, is clearly important. It's going to be a, a massive driver of productivity going forward, but it's not necessarily something new. 
Um, but the market's love affair with, with AI is something new, and it does create bubble-like conditions in some of these names to us. So we want to diversify beyond that. As you know, we love quality, we love technology, but we're also pairing that with some areas that are going to help us protect against valuation risk. Those areas have run a lot. So we're looking at places like U.S. mid-cap equities to do that. We want to make sure that we're kind of combing underneath the market to find some pockets of discount to marry with that mega-cap high-quality allocation that we have in the portfolio. Michael Hartner of Bank of America this morning, picking up on the moment, said, would be so on brand for stocks to melt up into recession, suck them all right in before the hard landing. Jay, how would you push back against that? I tell Mike he should look at his own research, which shows that uh, equities have had significant cash outflows uh, for the last five weeks. Sentiment is absolutely horrible. People are not participating. So the idea that you have a, uh, a, a melt-up, which is possible because money comes in finally, um, but to go into a recession, look, I mean, the housing is bottomed. Auto production is booming. The inventory destocking, which uh, damaged growth over the last year, is now shifting to a restocking, which is going to help the ISM PMI manufacturing data to break back above 50. So consumer is fine, record low unemployment, housing <clears throat> is bottomed. I mean, I don't, I don't see a recession. I, at some point, people are going to have to give up on the recession. And I think that's when the Fed uh, validates that give up by raising its growth estimates. The Fed is going to be the cover for the recessionistas to finally throw in the towel. Well, when they throw in the towel, that's probably the moment we get one, Jay. You know how it works. Jay Koloski, uh -huh. Emily Rowland, the two of you are going to stick with us. Here's a mover for you going into the opening bout, 20 minutes away. The team on Bloomberg Surveillance did a wonderful job of breaking this news. Morgan Stanley, just a touch lower. James Gorman, the CEO, stepping down. At the annual shareholder meeting, here's the quote. It is the board to my expectation that it will occur at some point in the next 12 months. That is the current expectation in the absence of a major change in the external environment. Shanali Basak has more. Hey, Shanali. John, what a moment it is on Wall Street. This is one of the longest serving CEOs of this era. He's been in charge for more than a decade. He's about to turn 65. That is about the age that we're seeing a lot of CEOs start to turn the page. You are seeing the stock react uh, more immediately, slightly down. But remember, James Gorman is such a fixture at Morgan Stanley. He has made such a massive strategic change for this bank. Few really believed how well it would work out at the end. If you take a look at Morgan Stanley's stock price performance since he took over in January of 2010, you can see it outperforming relative to most of its rivals, certainly relative to Goldman Sachs, uh, only really trailing behind JP Morgan in that time frame. And when you look at its price to book value, it really does compete very, very strongly here with JP Morgan. Now, these strategic changes leave a big question. Who will take over next? This, John, is classic Morgan Stanley. They tell you something will happen in 12 months. They wait a couple months and then they tell you who has the top jobs. Right now, for two co-presidents, Ted Pick, Andy Saperstein, who is more closely aligned to the wealth business, whereas Ted is more closely aligned to institutional securities. Those are the two men to watch. You could also watch Dan Simkowitz, who runs investment management. And the race is on, especially when you know how much Morgan Stanley has pivoted to wealth management. Ted had previously been seen as the top contender here, but a big question mark uh, open now on Wall Street on who takes over next. Shanali, we've seen this game play out a few times. Do you remember Goldman, blank fight standing down? It was Schwartz versus Solomon, and we were watching that race for a while. Is it a repeat of that? It's a healthy competition, isn't it? And the thing about Morgan Stanley, it's pretty excruciating because you've seen this go on for a very long time. You've seen many generations of presidents at Morgan Stanley wait for that top job. And now the time has come. Uh, it, Andy, in particular, is very interesting, has been a lieutenant to James Gorman for a very, very long time, whereas Ted Pick had grown up under Colm Keller, the previous president who we now know is uh, the chair of UBS. And so uh, very loyal talent under both of these people and that is what makes this race on wall street just so interesting what a company he's built 
what a run. Just phenomenal. James Gorman stepping down. We'll pick up on that story again around the opening bow. That stock is just a touch lower in early trading in the pre-market, down by 0.6%. Plenty of big moves out there. Let's get a few of them for you. Here's Abby. Indeed, John. And turning to regional banks, let's take a look at the shares of PacWest because they are popping higher for a third day. In fact, up more than 25% of the current gains hold to the close uh, over the last three days. And this was set off by Western Alliance's positive uh, bank deposit growth a few days ago. Deer also higher, up 3.4%. They put up a monster quarter, an 8% revenue beat on almost $16.1 billion $10.11 per share in adjusted earnings. That's an 18% beat on big demand for farm equipment. To the downside, though, raw stores down almost 1%. Guidance is seen as light for the retailer. And then finally, Applied Materials, the cap equipment maker, down 1.53%. Their guidance upcoming uh, is on the low end uh, memory chip uh, that slump weighs those, that stock down 1.5%, John. Abby, thank you. Coming up on this program, cracks emerging in one of this year's big consensus trades. Most client meetings, not recently, but about two weeks ago, it was, we agree, we think euro goes higher, we think the pound goes higher, we think the yen goes higher. That's now changed quite substantially. Some big changes out there, that conversation, up next. data in Europe has really underwhelmed. I, I thought at first we could ignore it. I thought the factory orders falling lower, that's something that maybe could be corrected in the next month. But what we've actually started to see is the more forward-looking signals, such as the ZEWs, those sort of Centex index in Europe, they've also been turning lower as well. So the momentum's gone. Most client meetings, not recently, but about two weeks ago, it was, we agree, we think Euro goes higher, we think the pound goes higher, we think the yen goes higher. That's now changed quite substantially with these the data surprises and market moves. And I think it's a lot more uncertain out there. Big changes out there. Bank of America's Michael Hartner picking up on the zeitgeist at the moment. AI just making babies of the bears. Consensus was bullish China, bearish US. It will be the mirror opposite by Independence Day. JP Morgan's Mislav Mateja picking up on that theme, saying this. The activity upswing seen around the turn of the year, helped by the falling gas prices in Europe, by China's reopening, is unlikely to transition into an acceleration in the second half. Nomura's Jordan Rochester following up. European and Chinese data surprises are in free fall pushing the eurozone data surprises to big lows. It points to weaker growth expectations and with it, a stronger US dollar in the near term. Are these just cracks or is one big consensus trade unraveling? Mm -hmm. Emily Rowland, Joe Poloski, back with us. Emily, weigh in on this one. Are mm -hmm. we pushing back against that rest of the world story? Yeah, John, I'm going to say something not a lot of strategists say on your show. We've been wrong about the call in Europe. You know, it's been unbelievable to watch the resilience of European markets uh, over really starting in the third quarter of last year based on China reopening, based on better weather in Europe. But our view has been that you want to allocate assets to higher quality markets. You want to underweight more cyclical areas of the world that should be more impacted as global economic growth slows and we did start this week with some pretty disappointing data out of china whether or sorry out of europe industrial production eurozone gdp came in at just about zero percent and meanwhile these markets continue to surge there's a fomo element here there's a sentiment momentum element that's been driving these markets higher and i don't know what the catalyst is you know you look at japan reaching new highs you look at european equities at 52 week highs i don't know if it was better news around the debt ceiling which doesn't make a ton of sense to us or something else but there's been a lot of resiliency there we would trim those areas of the market, we would redeploy to the U.S. more higher quality, more defensive assets as we wait out this late cycle environment. The DAX right now, record high. Luxury names year to date. They've been absolutely <laughs> flying. Jay, I know you're going to push back against the view that maybe we should retrench here. Uh, yes, John. I, I, I will fill my role here, buddy. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we've been uh, quite bullish uh, on Europe for well over years. You know, we've talked about it forever. Uh, at the end of last year, beginning of this year, uh, on this show, I talked about switching our focus to Asia, uh, and particularly Japan. Um, and we're we're just very bullish on uh, Japan. Uh, Japan, you know, the S and P is at a year-to-date high. Japan is at a 33-year high, and the reason for that is because finally 
they're exiting structural deflation. And you have the highest wage gains in the last 30 years in Japan. And so what this means is that Japan is the fastest growing of the G7 economies. Uh, and so you have earnings growth, you have very cheap valuation. Half of the Japanese stock market, John, trades under book value. And there are governance changes taking place to force companies to trade above book value. So you're seeing massive share buybacks, you're seeing mergers and acquisitions, the PE companies are all over Japan. And we think there's more to come uh, in the sense that we expect the end of yield curve control to happen in the next couple of quarters. That's going to lead, we believe, to a massive asset allocation shift among domestic investors yeah. who have been buying nothing but bonds for the last several years to start buying stocks. So the chart looks beautiful. The, the market is still cheap. Yes, it's a little extended, uh, but I think Japan is going to significantly outperform the U.S. over the second half of this year. Well, that, Jay, that's a very specific call on one particular country. For the rest of the world, Emily, which we've been talking about, China's been the main theme for so many people. Is the data validating a cyclical story? Is copper validating a cyclical story? Is there anything out there validating it right now for you? Yeah, not for us. And by the way, I do love a beautiful chart, so I hate to argue with you, Jay, here. But, you know, we're not really seeing the catalyst for this shift to more cyclical areas of the market. Look at PMI data, well below 50 for the rest of the world, just above 50 on the manufacturing side here in the U.S. So we would be fading that. Again, sentiment, FOMO, critical drivers here. But there's only so long that we think sentiment can move these markets forward. We, we look to the U.S., again, as having that higher quality element to it. That's where we want to be in a late cycle environment. Look, this is a tricky, tricky period. In a late cycle environment, it doesn't mean you want to dump equities. You still want to have some exposure to stocks. Things can run. We're clearly seeing this as of late. We would want to be really thoughtful about, again, underweighting areas that are going to be more sensitive to the global economy. We all love a beautiful chart. Emily Rowland, Jay Piloski, we're out of time. That was great. <laughs> I knew we'd have a good time. I appreciate it. Have a good weekend, guys. Going into the opening bell, seven minutes away. Coming up the morning calls and later. We'll speak to Morgan Stanley's Jim Curran and why the Fed's preparing for a pause and not a rate hike in June. That conversation coming up shortly. We will not discuss with him why his boss is on his way out the door. James Gorman stepping down at Morgan Stanley. That's the latest news this morning. The stock is negative by 0.6%. Let's get the mic on. There we go. Four minutes away from the opening bell. Equities up by about 0.3% on the S&P. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Macquarie downgrading Disney to neutral, warning that numerous uncertainties could start weighing on investor sentiment. Argus upgrading Wendy's to buy, expecting the company to benefit from international expansion and investments in its digital business. And finally, Citigroup upgrading the gap to neutral. $8 price target, seeing a more balanced risk reward with shares hovering at 3 year lows. That stock is up by about 1.5%. Coming up, another retailer sounding the alarm on a softer consumer, plus Morgan Stanley's Jim Curran on why it's better to be balanced rather than defensive in today's market environment. And we'll catch up with Shanali Basak on the latest from Morgan Stanley and James Gorman. Stepping down. Is the bumpy road to nowhere starting to go somewhere? Two-day pop on the S&P 500, biggest two-day move going back to about April on the S&P 500 right now. New highs for the year. Equity futures positive 0.2% on S&P 500. Futures on the Nasdaq, just about positive on the Nasdaq. Here's the opening bell, switch to the board and get to the bond market. Yields high on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Again this morning at the front end of the curve on a 10-year. At the longer end of the curve, higher by four or five basis points. Just south of 370, 369 there on a two-year in America. Yield tie there, six basis points. We started this week opening up on a two-year below 4%, right now above 430. Seen some dollar strength around that story. Euro dollar a break of 108 yesterday, just above it earlier. Now just around that level, 107.97, positive 0.2%. And crude, just about positive here. 
up by eight or nine tenths of one percent, seventy-two dollars and about fifty cents. About thirty seconds into the session, positive zero point two percent on the S&P 500. The number one stock to watch at the opening bell, Morgan Stanley. Here's the news: James Gorman announcing plans to step down as CEO within the next twelve months, telling shareholders at their annual meeting the following: "It's the board and my expectation that it will occur at some point." in the next 12 months. That is the current expectation in the absence of a major change in the external environment. Shanali has more. Hey, Shanali. Hey, John. If you take a look at it, of course, you have Morgan Stanley shareholders. Initial reaction being the stock down. You have to remember that James Gorman at Morgan Stanley was a huge reason that the stock has become one of the best performers in the market since he took over, only behind J.P. Morgan and the rise of about 185% in the market since then compares with 95% over at Goldman Sachs in that same time frame. We've been talking about it a lot, the strategic shifts that he has made. The former McKinsey executive here had really made these tough choices over at Morgan Stanley that paid off in the longer term. Now, if you think about the next generation here, that is the big open question. There are really three people to watch here. We've been talking about Andy Saperstein, who has really reshaped the wealth business. We have talked about Ted Pick, who has been the leader of the institutional business, grew up in that business went through some very tough changes in that business over the last even five years alone, but also Dan Simkowitz. We should talk about him as well because he runs that asset manager, which just five or six years ago, you couldn't even imagine surpassing a trillion dollars. And here we are, Morgan Stanley competing, previously the little sister of the industry, and now competing with the Giants. It's turned around in a massive way with his leadership. Shanali, we talked about Goldman and the race to take over from blank fine. Back in the day, Harvey Schwartz, David Solomon, let's talk about this race and maybe offering a template for what might happen or might not happen at JP Morgan. Just this elegant move away from the CEO role just to sit there as the chairman. Is that a template for us? Where do you think? I think it is a template because the new generations over at JP Morgan, for example, uh, they are quite homegrown, but there are a lot of questions about what such a big bank would look like without Jamie there. So it is an interesting solution to have them in the sidelines. Remember, the age is also different here. James Gorman is turning also very elegant, 65 years old this year. That is the uh, age now that is seen as the uh, kind age to start turning the page as uh, Jamie Diamond has been at the helm longer. He has done more acquisitions over a long period of time. He is really um, so rooted in this firm. He's 67. And so there are real questions here about when he is also going to turn the page and whether his deputies are ready. Five years. It's usually just five more years, right? Five more not, years. Not 12 months. But <laughs> One day, when he maybe. says 12 months, when he says 12 months, then it gets serious. Shanali, wonderful coverage. Looking forward to your coverage through this morning. Morgan Stanley negative by about 1% in the early part of the session. Let's turn to earnings quickly. Dear, raising its full year profit forecast amid strengthening demand and easing supply chain woes. The CEO is saying this. We can continue to benefit from favorable market conditions and an improving operating environment. Abby has more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, it's interesting because peak ag, the fears that peak ag, we may be seeing it, it's not hitting Deere's results, at least not in this quarter. A big quarter, they beat earnings in a big way. Adjusted earnings were uh, a 18% beat $10.11, an 8% revenue uh, beat almost $16.1 billion. So big, big numbers growing. They raised the outlook to your point. Uh, interestingly, this stock is down on the year, but now thanks to today's pop, the best day since early February, the shares of Deer are down less than 10 percent. So it seems as though they are turning a quarter, but more is needed because some analysts are still concerned uh, that peak ag could drag. But at least right now, Deer managing that very well. Stock up more than 3 percent. Abby, thanks for that. Let's take a look at Disney, the company announcing plans to begin removing programs from its streaming service. Just the latest step in its efforts to reduce losses and cut costs. The stock's down by 1%. Kelly Lines, there is so much news around this company in the last 24 hours. I don't know where to start. Yeah, well, if we start there with the streaming service, these are shows that they already had decided not to renew, but now they are removing them from the service entirely to avoid the additional costs, like paying, res paying residual fees to the participants in the shows. Again, trying to return this business or bring it really to profitability. The other news, though, comes down in Florida, where Disney has canceled plans to relocate 2,000 employees from California to the sun Sunshine State with an $864 million campus they were planning to build no longer being built. They're also going to shutter 
at their Star Wars hotel that cost, mind you, $4,800 minimum for two nights. This is amid the ongoing fight Disney has with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. They didn't mention that directly in these announcements, just cited changing business conditions. So maybe read between the lines there, John. But the governor's office did put out a statement saying this move wasn't surprising, given the company's financial straits, falling market cap, and declining stock price. And again, John, the stock price is declining this morning, down a little more than 1% here at the open. 92.65. Kelly, thanks for that. That's the wrap with Disney. Where to start, where to end. Disney getting a downgrade. Shares of Disney downgraded to neutral over at Macquarie. The team over there writing the following. Linear networks are getting worse fast. Ad revenues will likely remain negative in the fiscal third quarter and affiliate revenue may remain negative for good as cord cutting gathers speed. We see the stock as range bound for now. That stock, as Kelly indicated, is down about 1% this morning. What a shift to retail. Shares of Foot Locker getting absolutely hammered after cutting their annual sales forecast. The CEO is saying the company's revenue has, quote, softened meaningfully given the tough macroeconomic backdrop. Isabel Lee has more. Hey, Isabel. Hi, John. Tough indeed. If you need more evidence that Americans are pulling back on their spending, look no further than to Foot Locker. The company cut its annual sales forecast, saying revenue will fall by as much as 8% this year. That's down from the initial 5.5% that they projected. Profit forecast is also down. Now seeing adjusted earnings of as much as 225, that's lower than the previous high end of the 365 revenue. Shares are tanking. Indeed, it's now down by around 25%. A year to date, Foot Locker is also down by 16%. But John, this is a broader story because Foot Locker isn't the only one warning about this. We have Home Depot, Target, Walmart. The U.S. is really seeing a big demand problem, John. A quarter of the value of that company gone, just like that, in six minutes of trading. It's about thanks for that. The broader market right now, 34200 on the S&P 500 just positive by 0.24% on the S&P. Looking ahead to Chairman Powell a little bit later on this morning. It was nearly nine months ago on August 26th, 2022, that Chairman Powell said this. While higher interest rates, slower growth, and softer labor market conditions will bring down inflation, they will also bring some pain to households and businesses. These are the unfortunate costs of reducing inflation. But a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. That was Jackson Hole nine months ago. So what happened next? The unemployment rate that summer, 3.5%. The unemployment rate now, 3.4%. As for the market, the morning that Powell delivered that speech, the stock market opened up at 41.98. Yesterday, the stock market closed at, guess what, 41.98. Joining us now to discuss Morgan Stanley's Jim Caron. Jim Caron, what pain? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, well, there was some pain along the way, and, and that's absolutely for sure. But um, I think all the focus right now is on thinking about what the Fed's next move is going to be, and I think that they're going to stay on hold. So, look, I mean, the, the market is not the economy. The market is doing reasonably well. There's no question about that. But when you look at the economic data, it's holding up better than many people had thought. And you had mentioned earlier on the show that the Atlanta Fed now, GDP now, is even close to 3% for the second quarter. So all of that is really, really good. But we do have to recognize that the run rate of growth for this entire year is probably closer to 1% to 2%. We may get some slowing in, in the economy in the second half of the year. That certainly may be the case. But it's certainly not the, the, the disaster scenario that many people have been forecasting. So, look, the economy is slowing. We've hiked rates 500 basis points after all. It's supposed to slow. So the next move by the Fed, I think, is really just to stay on hold. The next move is no move. What would you expect to hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell later this morning, Jim? I think more of the same. I, I think that they're going to talk about this um, in not so many words, a higher for longer, getting to sufficiently tight policy levels. And sufficiently tight, that's going to be the code word, meaning that Sufficiently tight means that they can hold those levels there for an extended period of time. And I think that's going to be the statement that I'm looking for. If he says something along the lines of, you know, you know, potentially financial conditions need to tighten more or something like that, then I think the Fed's back in play. But I think sufficiently tight monetary policy levels is, is essentially going to be his message. We need to get a market call. Tony Dwyer of Canaccord Gemity, good program, good friend of this program over the last week or so, said to us he was too nervous to get short, too anxious to get long. You say this, Jim, it's a moment to be balanced. Can you tell us what the difference is between balanced and defensive? Because I hear defensive a lot. What does balance mean? 
So balanced means it ba balanced is an asset allocation decision, meaning that you're balancing the risks both upside and downside. And John, you and I have spoken about this all year. One of the things I've said is that risk on is a risk like any other risk, and it needs to be hedged. And what in, in what uh, defensive is, defensive is a style. So defensive positioning is when you expect an economic outcome and you position for it. And what we what, what we decided to do at the start of the year was really have more of a balanced look and basically say, look, there could be some downside, there could be some upside, let's position a portfolio so it's durable if either scenario occurs. A defensive style portfolio is going to be one that's going to be more rooted in fixed income and um, and, and, and more defensive equity related sectors and, and what have you. So that's not the kind of environment that we're in right now. I think that the that the risks in the economy today and, and in the market is more balanced upside and downside than what the consensus bearish narrative would suggest. So I think a, a balanced portfolio that really allows you to play for both either the upside or the downside, so it's really it's a good asset allocation strategy, well-diversified portfolio, is better than selecting what you believe will be a defensive outcome or a negative outcome and positioning defensively because of it. And that's why we think it's better to be balanced than defensive. So, Jim, can you walk us through how you would be balanced? And can we just start with positioning for upside? How would you capture that upside? What pockets of the market are you sitting in for that? Yeah, well, first of all, the equity market. I mean, you know, it, essentially, what is a balanced portfolio right now? Is it 60-40? Is it 50-50? What, what, is, what is the case? What we've seen is that there's been an underweight to equity risk. People have favored cash, and they favored fixed income. And you can see that from building cash levels. One of the things that we've put into our portfolios is a more aggressive, higher allocation to equity. Now, our allocation to equity right now is, is roughly about 50 to 55 percent relative to fixed income. That's not extraordinarily bullish. That's relatively balanced at, at this point. But when we compare that to the narrative in the market and the positioning that we see in the market, if you look at long short ratios and, and, and things like that, the markets are, 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 are pretty much underweight equity risk. So all we're saying is get back to more of a neutral equity component. And John, look, one more thing. When we look at the equity market, it's it's 25 percent up in tech. 3% up in uh, consumer uh, discretionary and 3% up in, in industrials. Everything else is flat to down. So this is not a wide breadth market. If we do get some reasonable economic data and growth, the rest of the broad market could actually start to do better. And it's coming from a negative on, on the year. So there, there are some positive possibilities that I think that we need to hedge for. We could disappoint to the upside is the way I like to say it. Jim, that's the equity side of the story. Can we throw in credit as well? Credit just seems to be stuck somewhere in the middle right now. How are you playing that? So our view is that we're not going to have a hard landing. So as a result of that, we see default risk as being relatively low. But we also think that the interest rate markets, the government bond market, has priced in, and well, at least a couple of weeks ago anyways, or even the start of this week, had priced in a lot of rate cuts. So one of the things that we're doing is we're allocating more towards high yield and more towards credit to, to collect the coupon, the all-in yield, but we're reducing the interest rate sensitivity of the portfolio. So that means that we're trying to step away from U.S. Treasuries and we're trying to add more towards high yield and, to, and towards investment grade credit and even, and even non-agency mortgages. These are areas that we think are going to do reasonably well in a non-hard landing scenario, and that's, our and that's our base case. Hey, Jim, love it. Great to catch up. Jim Karen there of Morgan Stanley talking about disappointing to the upside. Disappointing if you're not positioned for it. Three-day gain on the S&P 500. About 13 or 14 minutes into the session, the S&P is up by 0.3%, advancing once again. Michael Hartnett of Bank of America, great note again this morning from Michael and the team over at B of A. It would be so on brand for stocks to melt up into recession, suck them all right in before the hard landing. This is we reprice the yield curve higher, particularly at the front end of the curve over the last few days. Every single day this week, this two years has been higher. Started the week just south of 4%, right now north of 4.30. 4.33, call it 4.34 on a two-year, up by eight basis points. Euro move starting to fade again, 107.93, just seeing a touch of euro strength after a few days of dollar strength on the other side of the trade. And if you are just tuning in, the latest news this morning, James Gorman planning to step down from Morgan Stanley, announcing at the firm's annual meeting, it is the board's and my expectation that it will occur at some point in the next 12 months. That is the current expectation in the absence of a major change in the external environment. That stock is, at the moment, Morgan Stanley, slightly negative this morning. Coming up on this program, plans taking shape for a debt limit vote on Capitol Hill.
The negotiations are currently making progress. As Speaker McCarthy has said, he expects the House will vote next week if an agreement is reached, and the Senate would begin consideration after that. That conversation, up next. This is Bloomberg's The Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Columbia economics professor Glenn Hubbard. That conversation at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. This is Bloomberg. The negotiations are currently making progress. As Speaker McCarthy has said, he expects the House will vote next week if an agreement is reached, and the Senate would begin consideration after that. Members should remain aware and be able to return to the Senate within a 24-hour period to fulfill our responsibilities to avoid default. Everybody playing nice for now. According to a White House official, Biden telling his hand-picked negotiating team in Washington that he's confident Congress will act in time. Speaker McCarthy also sounding confident. I see the path that we could come to an agreement. And uh, I think we have a structure now, and everybody's working hard. And I mean, we're working two or three times a day, then going back, getting more numbers. The mood music sounds OK. The numbers do not. The Treasury's cash balance dropping to $68.3 billion, according to the latest data. That's down from $94.6 billion a day earlier, down from $140 billion at the end of last week. With Axios reporting at the moment, the Secretary Yellen is warning both publicly and privately that the early June next day is real. Kelly Lines joins us now from D.C. for the latest. Hey, Kelly. Hey, John. Well, I spoke with a former Treasury spokesperson on balance of power earlier this week who also said we should take that seriously. No joke, no smoke. If she says as early as June 1st, that date is real, especially as you alluded to. We do have the Treasury's cash balance now at the lowest level since 2021. So that just speaks to how tight the timeline realistically is here. Even if we do buy the fact that progress in the talks is happening, all of this optimism is actually real, that, that compromise still needs to be turned into actual legislative text put on the floor of the House, voted on passed on the Senate, voted on passed, and then ultimately get to the president's desk. That is a lot that has to happen in a less than two-week period in theory. And it does become a question of the vote count as well, because we, have un we understand that work requirements for entitlements has become a real sticking point. That is not something that progressives in the House would like to vote for. It's a big issue with the Congressional Black Caucus as well. Then in the Senate, you had a group of senators, including the likes of Senator Bernie Sanders, writing a letter to the president yesterday saying that he shouldn't be giving things up. Instead, he should evoke the 14th Amendment. At the same time, the House Freedom Caucus also put out a statement yesterday saying no further negotiation should happen until the Senate passes the bill the House passed. So what it feels like, John, is that at the, the sides of the parties, they seem to be moving away from the idea of compromise at the very same time that those in the middle, those negotiating, are trying to move toward it. And Kayla, you said it. You went through the process there. That piece of it, voted on, passed. Is that the piece of it that a lot of people in Washington are nervous about at the moment? Yeah, that's really what it comes down to now, John, is the vote count. Because if we are starting to see the contours of a deal forming, what really is contains in it and whether or not it is passable is going to be key. Because remember, Speaker McCarthy made a lot of promises to certain members of his caucus just to get the initial bill he passed through. Many in the Republican Party likely would not want to vote for a package that saw a lot of that taken away. So you're going to need some Democratic votes. But again, there are Democrats who have serious issues with some of uh, what measures could be on the table here. So the math could get very tricky on both the Republican and Democratic side, John. Kelly, thanks. That's the roundup down in Washington. I mentioned that story from Axios. Here's the lead paragraph from it. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warning the country's biggest bankers that a potential debt ceiling default will have repercussions beyond the financial system and insisted, this is the key part, that the early June X date is real. That's their latest reporting this morning. The latest price action this morning, 22 minutes into the session. We are just about positive on the S&P for a third session. 
up by 0.3% with a sector price action. Here's Abby. And being higher for a third session, John, means at least this week that the S&P 500 is up more than 2% on the week. The best week going back to March. As for sectors today, energy leading the way up 1.3% with oil higher. Healthcare is also up 1%. Only two sectors are down, technology and discretionary. And in the middle, we have financials. Uh, they are up about three-tenths of 1%, despite the fact that on the day, Morgan Stanley is down. Last time I looked, down by about 1% on this news that Morgan Stanley's CEO, James Gorman, is to step down uh, with in 12 months on the week though morgan stanley is higher that's true too for the financial sector with lots happening also for the regional banks of about three percent there for the financials taking a look at some of the other sectors we have lots of the big tech sectors higher uh, communication services we also have the tech sector itself higher consumer discretionary so those are the three mega cap tech sectors and there's those financials again net net john a bullish week avi thank you a better week on many fronts as we inch towards the weekend. Before we get to the weekend, a few more things to get through. Your trading diary up next. Three day winning streak on the S&P 500. We'll see if this sticks. Longest winning streak on the S&P going back to early April. That's the price action right now. Let's get to the trading diary. It looks like this. Fed Chair Jay Powell speaks at 11 Eastern time. Then looking ahead to next week, JP Morgan's Investor Day coming up on Monday. Plus more Fed speak from Bullard, Bostick and Barkin. Looking further into next week, another round of new home sales. And then Wednesday, we get the FOMC minutes as well. From New York City, that does it for me. Thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. Good luck for the rest of the trading day and have a wonderful weekend if you can. From New York, this was the Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg.